And we're back. This is Postmortem with Destiny, and I want to thank you for joining me this week, and I want to thank you for your patience. It's my hope to upload an episode of this podcast every week, but it's been about three weeks since I last uploaded, and that's because I was waiting to get an interview with a woman who was well worth the wait. Chloe Kensington is a proud black trans woman, and she is an activist. She is the co-founder and president of the Stiletto Sister Society that aims to help trans women get out of prostitution and reintegrate into society if they so wish to. Chloe is candid, she is honest, and she is full of passion about these issues that are affecting our community. We have had four LGBTQ people of color murdered in Jacksonville since the beginning of the year. On February 4th, Celine Walker was shot dead at an extended stay America in the South Point area of Jacksonville. On June 1st, Antiche English was shot to death between two abandoned homes in the 1500 block of Ella Street. On June 24th, Catalina James was shot dead at Equality Inn and Suites in the 8300 block of Dix Ellis Trail. And on July 19th, Jesse Sumler was found shot to death in his Northside apartment. Now, Chloe co-founded the Stiletto Sister Society after she lost her god sister, Antiche. She sat down and she talked with me about the kind of woman Antiche was and the kind of man that she knew Jesse to be. She was friends with these people in the community and they are more than just murder statistics. She also sat down and talked with me a little bit about what it was like to sit with JSO and help form the now nine officer strong liaison team with the LGBTQ community. So that team is going to work to listen to the concerns of the LGBT community and hopefully better the relationship between the community and police. Since we last spoke, there has been an arrest made in the Jesse Semler case and a sketch has been released of a suspect in the Catalina James case. And that's where we sit. And without further ado, here's Chloe Kensington. She's an amazing woman and I really appreciate her sitting down with me. I'm just interested in sort of, you told a nice anecdote about um, Shay at the meeting that you guys were pageant rivals, but you were friends for a long time. And I'm just interested in the kind of woman that she was because we don't have that information. We have that she died tragically and that's about it. And I think that's sort of an unfair narrative. Auntie Shay was someone who loved life. Um, She really did. Um, I mean, I don't get on the bad side, but she really wasn't someone that I can, I, I, off the top of my head, remember really having a serious argument with anybody. I mean, she just kind of liked to be present in the moment. And you, when you meet people like that, you recognize them, you know, and it's because who they are, it, that's who they are. It stays with you. And so I can think back to 19 to now when I saw her uh, last time at the beginning of the year uh, alive. That was um, just, we, we just sat at a bar and did absolutely nothing. We did absolutely nothing having uh, Long Island smoking and, and talking and just thinking about uh, you know, nothing. I mean, yesterday, you know, it was just so great. And I, when I tend to go out to especially that club, it's really to be safe and to feel safe, to be able to wear whatever cute I want to wear or it's revealing I want, whatever. And just to, it's an exhale moment for me, if you will. So for me, that's what I remember most about our last time is that we were both just so present in the moment of life and I I remember feeling heavy burdened about something but by the time I left because I don't get drunk I don't even get tipsy so don't get that impression but by the time I left I I was just like you know I'm good and I remember she uh she didn't have a car I don't know she her boyfriend had it or something but um I was going to leave and I the person I, I I was calling an Uber, and when my Uber got there, I remember her standing on the corner, right in front of the building, and I said to her, take your, you know, behind home, and she said, Robert's coming to get me, and I kind of thought she was blowing me off, and so when I got in the Uber, I called Robert, I said, are you coming to get her? 
And he said, yeah, a couple of minutes away. And I said, well, okay, you, just, you make sure you call me when you get there. Let me know if she's in that car with you. And you know, for me, that was the final curtain call for her. So, um, you tend to hold on to those moments in such a time as this for inspiration and for guidance and even for forgiveness sometimes um, cause I, I have I, <laughs> I suffer from this uh, not enough not good enough syndrome and there have been a couple of times where I, I said you know this I don't know why I'm I'm not I'm not the girl to do <laughs> People have their nice comments, but it seems like when I start feeling that way, every last couple of times, anyway, it's kind of like she's appeared. Whether it was through a song that you know shouldn't have even come up on YouTube, or it's that she, I, I could see her doing, and it, and I remember, yeah, I probably am exactly the person who should be doing this for her. And then to have it happen um, to Jesse, someone I wasn't as close to, but knew, liked, appreciated his being. Um, he was a real smooth, easygoing uh, personality. He was very quiet, soft-spoken. At least, you know, what I knew of him. I mean, we all have a drink and kind of get a little... And, and, and I saw those moments because I've seen this, I saw this young kid from when he was a kid. I, I'm probably about seven or eight years older than him. So, you know, yeah, I, and to me, even when I, you know, he still looks like a kid, you know. And so, very youthful, very, but I saw his maturity as he, you know, and I remember, I, went to Orlando for Mother's Day and I I came back um, in that following week I said you know I just want to just go out I, I don't drink at home so I was like I just want to go out and have a drink and just kind of chill at the bar and just sit there and I remember I went very un glamorous Glamified. Um, early, you know. I just, I really didn't want to. And it was, <laughs> I had on this wig that went back into a straight ponytail. And I was sitting there and I was in my phone. And next thing I knew, my head went backwards. <laughs> I was like, what the hell? And I turned around and he had pulled my hair so fast and kind of switched on off and looked back and was like, hey. Hey, and you know that that was the curtain call for that friend for me. So um, I took both of their passings uh, seriously, and it gave me do it gave me great honor to um, greet their families in their time of mourning, and for Anna Shay to. deliver the, her uh, resolution of, of life on behalf of the little sisters society. It's one of the hardest things I've ever done in my life. To stand in front of her parents or all those people and, and pronounce her to be job, to, 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 you know, that a job was well done. That was so, but it was such an honor. It and you know, which reminds me, you know, to I, I, you know, to 
much is too much is given, much is required. It was her mother who came to me after that service and said, you know, I've never even heard something said so, or whatever she said so beautiful or written so beautiful and she asked me for a copy and of course I had one for her in my purse. And she opened it and you know, it was a scene like a scene from a movie. She kinda just opened it. It was a fold in a three part. She opened it inside of the limo and I'm kneeled down on the side of the limo and she she kind of looked at it and she took her hand and kind of like blessed it almost like, you know, like she said, you did such a beautiful job, my baby would be proud and asked me to keep in contact with her. And at that moment, this became real for me. So, you know, you gotta, We were born to die, you know. If you're lucky and blessed, you get to laugh, love, and trust a little in between. No guarantees. Thank you for sharing that with me. I really appreciate it. And I think that if anybody ever questioned, and I, and I mean people outside the community, if they ever questioned the seriousness of this movement or the seriousness of you, this isn't because you want to have fun. This isn't because you just one day and woke up and felt like you needed to do something. This is very, very real for people in the community. And I think that that is the important message that it's my job to convey. And so. I think that you do such a, a good job at it. So could you tell me a little bit about the Stiletto Sister Society, um, what it is? We formed the Stiletto Sister Society um, in June of this year out of a way to heal from the murder of a friend of mine, um, Anna Shea, Divine English. And her companion and I wanted to do something. We wanted uh, to make a difference. We wanted her, the loss of her life, to make a difference. Uh, we didn't want her to die in vain. And so from there, we found uh, ourselves accepting invitations to rallies and city council meetings. And before I knew it, it, it had taken on really a life of its own and in, in part really transformed my life in doing so. So as co-founder and president, um, our mission now is to provide resources to the transgender community wherein they can find ways and means to become uh, a respectable citizen in this community. As well as we want to focus on providing people with the tools to empower themselves to make their communities better. And in doing so, often that means we have to hold uh, elected officials accountable. Sure, and I was at the city council meeting when you were there and that was to um, sort of bring the liaison group from JSO um, and let the LGBTQ plus community know that JSO is working on um, these crimes, the murders, including the murder of Antashe. And um, you spoke and said some pretty powerful things there, especially after the little protest when the people got up and walked away. And you said that, you know, it was important for us to work with these elected officials and hold them accountable. And you said that a little bit just now, but what do you mean by that, I guess? Well, what we are focused on now is trying to bridge the gap in communication between JSO, our Jacksonville Sheriff's Office, and the LGBT community overall. Um, what that means at this point uh, is that the community has laid out its requests and or demands for JSO and as one of the selected uh, activists in this community uh, I was extended an invitation to the initial meeting with three other activists myself and uh, JSO uh, which included uh, the sheriff his under sheriff and his uh, I think what I would call the executive sheriff's team down to his liaison Marlo Zarka who has been very instrumental in helping us to 
move this conversation forward. So what we want to do now with uh, one of the requests, excuse me, for from the community was a liaison officer. Um, there have been several transgender uh, equality groups and uh, equality groups for the LGBT community overall that had been allocating for uh, the said officer. When I got involved in the conversation, I remembered an officer uh, from the days that I was working in the club circuit, and uh, you know his name was Officer John. And for almost 10 years, you know, I saw him. We we got to know him. Uh, he was there for us. He would work events that were sponsored by by people uh, outside of you know official business. And I, when I re returned back to Jacksonville, I remember a couple of years ago asking some. Have you seen Officer John? And who knows what's happened? I'm sure he's probably retired in Boca Raton now, living very well. But the point is, is like we got to know him and that one guy was gone. And so when I, I think what was influential and what allowed me to be confident in the role and even be accepted in the role uh, at, in this conversation is that I allocated for a team. And it what that request was uh, generously, I think, welcome. It was entertained, and within a, a week and a half, uh, I was receiving an email saying, "Hey, we've we've got to start." And so the sheriff's watch meeting we had was just the beginning of uh, meeting that team, at least being able to say, "Okay, they are doing something." Um, that they weren't, you know, having us chase our tails or someone refer blowing smoke up my, you know, um, that they that progression was really happening. So um, now, here it is, uh, we're approaching, I think, for me, I'm, I'm already starting to have restless nights about it out of, out of a good, you know, a, a good anxiety. I'm really excited coming up on the 15th of August, wherein we will host a meet and greet to embrace the uh, LGBTQ liaison team from JSO and the community overall. Though my society uh, is really has a special interest and focus on transgender uh, equality and, and, and rights and camaraderie even, uh, what is exciting for me is that we can, as new as we are as a society, make a little bit of a difference in, in really what is a major way. And so the feedback from that has been awesome. People are really excited, of course. I am not dismayed. I understand there is still a lot of work to do. I understand that there's still trust to be built and conversations to be had. I totally understand that at this point, what is most important is the transparency of it uh, in this team. So we will host a meet and greet at CRC, um, the Community Resource Center. And I am really happy to see where we go from there. Uh, that's that's the, the progressive raha right now. And so, you know, I was, I guess I wasn't really surprised. Well, let me just put, so I'm only an ally um, and a media ally at that. So my position is pr both professional and also from mm -hmm. outside of the LGBTQ community. And all I can do is sort of listen and learn and absorb and try and use that in a professional way. So when I say that I was surprised that so many people got up and walked out, it might sound naive, maybe, but yeah, right. So I understand that there are frustrations just from talking to people, but I guess to me, it seemed like um, in order to have a dialogue, you have to have one, which was kind of your message as well. And so I was wondering how you felt about that. You say that you're not disillusioned, you know that there are frustrations, um, but how, I guess, do you overcome them? I can say in my position, because um, I think I'm being real, real, you know, well trained for it, in my, in my position, the answer to that question is one step at a time, one day at a time, one conversation at a time. And this is the most talking I do, because when I'm working, it's more about the listening to hear the concerns of the people, to be able to empathize, sympathize, and relate. Um, 
that has been, for me, an Achilles heel because I, I'm so introverted as a person. And, you know, I have, you know, in, in a sense, led a, a really different life than a lot of the community that I'm now trying to embrace, help, support, speak for in some cases. And so I have a lot of learning uh, to do. I've been learning a lot, but I have a lot of learning to do. And in order to learn, you must listen. Yeah, I think that's great. I think that, yeah, I just think that's great because I think that um, a lot of people were there, especially at the last meeting, to, to listen, just to hear what's going on. And I, I really liked seeing a lot of the community come together like that. It was really cool. Now, I will say, since you, you brought it up, <laughs> I, I was very disenchanted. This conversation is moving forward because of the four slain black transsexual women. And what just, as I said, and I have no qualms about, is that particularly white gay people who aren't transgender have all this uproar and all these demands and all this, that's not getting us anywhere. So my advice is that if you don't want to be part of a progressive conversation, then just please be quiet. Don't make us look bad. Gay people, black people, activists, locals, don't don't make us. It's not about Chloe Kensington because, you know, my mama taught me a long time ago. They talked about Jesus and you are no better. So I don't really care about what you might say about me, but then when I have to sit in meetings with sheriffs and under sheriffs and deputy mayors and, and, and other, you know, heads of equality groups, it does not make me feel good or make me look good when the end of the conversation goes, now Miss Kensington, how are you going to make sure that they don't show up and become a riot? And, and that's not literally the question, but you know, that's what, that's what I hear, you know what I mean? So, and I have witnesses that will tell you, so for the next two or three days after that meeting, I'm glued to my phone and in messages, like trying to understand, but relay. And so it, this, this being a leader thing, it, it, it's to whom much is given, much is required. But at the same time, I know that people are excited. They're excited that we, the arrest in Jesse Sumler murder uh, has been arrested. I know we are overjoyed that uh, there's been a, uh, a sketch and there there's uh, some some le uh, leads coming out of Catalina James James's murder. And I know that this community, I know people are very happy that they they have a team that looks like them, that feels and acts and da da da. So. Uh, yeah, I, I just I want I want people to give us a chance. Because as much as the officers are a liaison team, you are also a liaison between the community and the you know the the governing entities. I mean, correct? Like that's what you're yes. saying, basically. Okay. I just want to double check. So you know when they stand up there and they're like, you know, there's nobody who has a seat at the table who looks like the people who are murdered. They're wholly incorrect. Right. Right, and in uh, in the particular case of the sheriff's watch meeting, I think the comment that really got under my skin because it was so unfounded. It was like you made that public scene and you were wrong. But there are no transgendered people on the uh, JSL force, and if they are, they don't choose to have the city know it. The people who are comprised of this liaison team are all voluntary. Now, the assignments are official, but it's a voluntary, that's why they didn't call, I, I, that's one of the reasons they didn't call it task force, to take down the, the level that it seems so official, because this isn't, you know, it's not a demand. At any point, the sheriff could say, hey, this isn't working, it's a race of our resources, let's just go back to this, or even demote it down to one. And so what we, and, and, and my grandmother says to me, and all, for all of my life, she's always said, when your hand's in the lion's mouth, you ease it out. And at this point, there are things they don't have to do that we're asking them to do. And in, in that case, our hands is in the lion's mouth. 
then there are situations where they're just not doing what they're supposed to do. And so they can be taken to task on those things. But instead of, you know, us, again, be, you know, be belligerent for lack of a better term, it's better to have a, uh, a, a respectful conversation with them allow them to see you know see the errors of their ways and know that we're we're watching and then if they don't do what they're supposed to do i like to remind people this is a midterm election year vote their asses out and so it's a balance it's a balance between the community keeping their eyes on the government governing entities and the governing entities serving the community the way that they should mm -hmm. absolutely and so i guess my next question is you spoke about this a little bit at the meeting. If you don't want to speak about it now, it's, that's okay with me. But you mentioned that you knew Antashe because both of you had for many, many years worked together. So you were on the drag circuit together and um, you competed in pageants together. And that up until the time that Antashe was with us, you felt very safe in your particular line of work. Mm -hmm. Do you think that the safety for people in that line of work are, you said you didn't like the term sex worker, so I'm not gonna use it. Do you think that the safety has gotten any better? <laughs> but I think it's important to talk about because we've got, we've um, got three dead transgender women who okay. were prostitutes. Absolutely not. And I will, let me, just a correction, I hate to sure. correct a report. No, no, please do. I, I, I would not say that there, I felt unsafe okay. doing what I chose to do. I, I, I won't say, because honestly, if I felt unsafe, I wouldn't have done it, mm -hmm. okay? There were, I need to say tears, a couple of instances where it was like, okay, well. It can happen in uh, any job, you know, worse than. There, that can happen in any job too, right, you know? Right, right, absolutely, uh, yeah. And that's, I remember that was a joke between me and my girlfriend Paris one day, I said, and you know, recently I said, I would have had more bad days on a job than I've had in the last six years have, doing what I, what I, I, I chose to do. But, uh, so that being said, no, I don't think that, um, I don't think that girls can lessen their awareness. I remember when I started falling in love with politics, I would hear President Barack Obama say all the time, um, we must remain vigilant. And now that is something I think if you somewhat, you're with me or around the last times I do public speaking. I, I, I constantly remind, remind girls of that. Remain vigilant. I don't have, right now, the resources to, you know, tell some girl, hey, don't ever answer that phone again. Come over here. We'll get you in an apartment or like that. We'll maintain your life. I, I don't have it. We're working towards that. And I do understand being from that lifestyle, though, that's what it takes. I understand that. Now, I never had to do anything, but I have met many girls who have found themselves in, in a less uh, resourceful situation than others. So what I do now in this position in a way that I try to be transparent and relatable to, all, to, to the girls that hear or read these interviews or anything, is that I give what I think are helpful tips. You know what I'm saying? It's very, you know, I, I have never been a girl to walk anywhere. I don't even like checking my mailbox. So I do not encourage girls to be on the streets. Um, and it, and it kind of cheapens your work, you know? Uh, I, I think that creating any type of trace of a conversation especially your whereabouts if you choose to do out calls or you know I made a lot of money traveling out of the city or out of the state uh, but at one point she didn't even know it but I was telling my mother this is where I was going and giving her information you know and now I was lying to her while, while I was going but someone knew that I could absolutely trust where I was going to be uh, and and I think that that's the most most valuable um, also what I know often are that girls, when guys come in a room or in your house or, or typically on some what we call, you know, BS, you know, you start to get a little vocal and, uh, you know, you start to, oh, you won't do that. But realize 
you know, and, and I, Lord knows I've been there where, look, this date can make or break if my cell phone bill is going to be on tomorrow. It went from something I wanted to do to, at one point, it felt like something I had to do because I had acquired such a lifestyle. Now, if I would have humbled myself, you know, I could have, you know, made it work. But I, I get that, okay? So, it's hard for me because I remember the work. I, I know the life. I know the anxiety over not having it. I know, uh, and, and we're not, I haven't, we haven't scratched on what it takes to be the girl financially. So it's very hard for me to say that, to lie when speaking about this situation. No, I don't think that anybody is safe. But hell, I don't really think anybody is safe, which is why we're, you know, trying to look at how to uh, narrate this conversation with JSO in a larger way to affect the whole community. Uh, but what, again, those, I, I say them all the time, let somebody know where you're going, remain cognizant, aware, vigilant, uh, and, hum and and humility. Humility goes a long way, especially, and, and doubt means don't. Lord knows I have learned that in my 36 years. Doubt means don't. Do not, and it definitely means do not then try to justify your damn doubt. You know what I mean? Doubt means don't. Just don't do it. For real. And and Lord knows, it. oh goodness, if I would have learned that lesson even 10 years ago, you and I probably wouldn't have been here. I just, I don't want to approach these conversations about sex work or prostitution or whatever you want to, whichever moniker you want to use for it in a way that's inflammatory, but I think it's something that the media is kind of afraid to talk about. But the reality of the situation is that these girls are out there, they're making a living, and sometimes they're clearly putting their lives at risk because we don't want to talk about it. We don't want to put protections in place because it's got the blanket of, of illegal on top of it. And so when something is illegal, then somebody who participates in it then becomes sort of a degenerate. And I think that that is a toxic way of thinking. And we've got, you know, we've got like, three and a half ish murders four murders to show for it so you know i i hope you don't feel like i'm trying to um be inflammatory about it i just think it's really important to talk about it because yeah, talk about the facts we can't help people if you, and that's what i'm learning especially with the different a lot of groups and organizations that are already here you know if you're not really getting to the source of the issue and i and I, you know some people have said to me that's why i'm a kind of a breath of fresh air, a welcome air into these conversations because it, 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 it just is what it is, you know. I did it, at, you know, I didn't want people to know it while I was doing it, but now it all makes sense for me. And, you know, so yeah, I, I listen, I'm not better than anybody. It's nothing to be, I'm not smarter than anybody. What I am is fed up. I'm, I'm really just fed up. And before this happened, I was looking for my out. What I, my friends would tell you, I, was, I, I kept saying, I'm building my 401k. I'm, I'm out, on my way out of this business. And there were one or two times where I tried and, and, and something happened. And so the Lord, I feel like, got my attention in such a personal but impersonal way. Because it could have been a little deeper. It could have been me. And, you know, uh, actually I was sitting in the, in the sheriff's office the first time and it dawned on me that earlier this year it was almost me I, I it was so dramatic that I really pushed it out of my mind that someone came into my house earlier this year with a gun with a gun and lit, basically raped me with a gun and stole my money at the same and I was just so well obviously I wasn't too much of anything because I kept doing it you know so two three months later this happened and I I decided to take the yes that I was giving to God a look well, heck of a lot more seriously. And he and still today it's it's some it you have to the you owe it to yourself. Everybody owes it to themselves to try to be the very best representation of themselves they can be. And you know, not to sound crude, but okay, so I've mastered, you know, the bedroom. I think I can do a couple of other things too. So th that's where I am and, and that's, I have to talk to myself. I have to get real with myself and say, you know, and there are things that, you know, I've gone through that people don't know and people would never know unless I open my mouth. But when I, it was like a week after my birthday or it could have been a week before. I don't know. I just remember it was around my birthday. I don't know. 
I, I, as I told them, you could look up the, the, the sheriff's phone calls. I called the police. It was like 3.30 in the morning. I sure did. And, and I got there, and, and yeah, they did. They made me feel like uh, my common phrase, why am I here? <laughs> why am I here? No, I'm not laughing. I'm laughing. But, you know, I, that's kind of how I dealt with it. You know, they shrugged it off, and so did I. And thank God, and I kept on going. I probably took my hat down for like a week until something needed to be paid, you know. Uh, but, yeah, so, trust it. Yeah, I, I have not had the horror stories because I've never really allowed myself to be in situations where the horror stories come, even, you know, I believe in vetting a client before they come over well. I like to hear your voice and hear the language that you use. So, I mean, I, I can look at how I've kept myself out of harm's way, but at the end of the day, the Lord's going to get your attention if he wants it. And when you, when you reference this, you mean the murder of Antasha, correct? I'm sorry, am I pronouncing her name correctly? Anna Shea. Anna Shea. You can call her Shay. Okay, Shay. I so think she wouldn't mind. Okay. So you, when you say the event that happened shortly after um, the violent mm -hmm. event that happened to you, you mean? Yeah, because I actually, what, what I came to find out is that my, what happened in my house was around the same time Celine Walker was murdered. Yeah. So when I began to really make all the connections of it all, that's when I said, this won't be just me speaking at a rally. I, I have to, and which is why I work so hard at it, because this is, I'm not getting a dime from it. Actually, I've spent a couple of dollars on it, but I need it to pay off for me, because at 36, it's like, now what? You know? Uh, it, it, I, I, I used to think I was one of the smartest people in the world, but I, <laughs> the old saying, how's it go, you're so smart, you're stupid. And, and that's how I feel at 36. Everything I thought I knew, I'm learning it again. But this time I vow to learn, at least try to learn it the right way. And that's what I encourage people to do. You know, um, to not let Anna Shea, Celine, uh, Christina, I, I don't really like to rope Jesse into that because I, I personally do not know the narrative behind his murder. Uh, yeah, he dressed up from time to time, but you know, I, I don't know if we are overstepping. Sure, that's why I said kind of three, that's why I said three, maybe three and a half, three, because yeah. nobody really knows. So I didn't mean to count his murder as a half murder. It's still tragic, but I didn't yeah. want to rope it in the I same way that you said. I, I, listen, I have, I've spent some time with you, you know, I know that you have Peer, what's your your peer uh, intention? But yeah, I mean, that's another thing I'm learning. Terminology is everything. People are very sensitive um, to it all. So what I hope to do with the Stiletto Sister Society is provide transparency for people to be able when I know when I'm sitting in different uh, equality meetings and groups and a lot of the questions is well what does the transgender community need or that and they, they they're such broad questions but again I'm only one person who's led my own life I've walked in my own stilettos as I tell them all the time I have not walked in everybody else's so we're doing what we're doing at our society is going on a fact-seeking mission for the next 90 days. All of the uh, events that we are hosting or co-sponsoring are to really seek information from the public. We want to know what is required uh, or expected of the this liaison team since, you know, we're kind of in the the unofficial business of micromanaging them in a sense, or at least making sure that they they remain uh, accurate and, and on top of things as we would like them to. Um, but also, I want to find an innovative and effective way to have conversations with transgender people who find themselves in prostitution. That would like to come out of it, you know? And, and oh my goodness, it's such a deeper conversation to be had. You know, it's not always because you were kicked out or because, oh, you went in and you felt applied for a job and you didn't get it. And even when it is those things, then we have to teach people 
how to persevere, how to be strong and be conquerors and not victims. Um, I, one of the bone uh, of contingency, a running thread in this community is the name identification of, of transgender people uh, after death. Well, I can understand the concern. So being that I cannot walk into JSO, hack their system and change the policy, <laughs> you know, or, uh, or, 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 you know, direct some directive to now, now we're, we're going to do this. What I can do, and we are doing, is empowering my community with the knowledge and the resources to change your name to where we can, uh, we have uh, quite a couple of uh, professionals who are volunteering their time and services and their resources to, for us to be able to provide people that. So that in God forbid, because one thing's for sure, we're all going to die. So when that time comes, that you can be prepared and how you, it, it, it will be legal, if that makes sense. Also, uh, what we'll be uh, looking into and discussing and providing re resources to are for people to, uh, or of the transgender community, to uh, execute their will. They're, you know, it, people look at it as morbid, but why spend all your time on earth fighting the, the police department when you haven't taken the steps that are our are, are, are rights, you know? So, and, and that's something else I, I learned from my mother particularly, you know, make sure your house is in order. That, you know, and I, she would say it in so many different ways, but that, that was truly a lesson that she taught my brother and I, my brother and I you know, before you can start put, pointing the finger at other people and telling people what you don't have because no one owed you anything. I, I, hear, I hear that as clear as that. That was big from her. No one owed you anything. So when you have uh, rights, okay, when there are resources available to you, when there are things that you can do that can effectively influence your own life, especially when you're over 20, I always say 23 because I just really like that number. But by 23, you should really have gotten some understanding of who you are. That is the first key, I think, for people even trying to, to have a real conversation with themselves with when it comes to prostitution. Who are you? You know what I mean? And from there, you define you. Don't let the, the outside world define who you are. You define you. And then carry yourselves accordingly. So what we want to do is put together, and don't worry, I won't be the person executing the workshops, you know, because I get into that, that preacher mode real fast. But um, I have worked and we've uh, assembled a great team of transgender women of uh, various walks of life, a couple of transgender men, some I believe they call cis women, you know, that are very, uh, their hearts of gold and that will put together this workshop on September 8th at CRC, uh, I think so cutely titled uh, Our Trans Circle, uh, Bridging the Gap and Community. So, uh, and there, We'll, we'll start to do our trans circle once a month um, and each it'll be three it's a three hour workshop where people can come speak voice their concerns let someone know what they're trying to work on to better themselves and we'll team them up we'll mentor we'll partner we'll inspire we'll encourage uh, we have anonymous surveys to really figure out where people's willingness is for help their willingness to help um, so when I say a fact-seeking mission, I am literally laying in bed at night, like YouTubing, just creative ways to have effective conversations. So that's the business side, but we want to um, also, you know, maybe have a couple of parties. You know, I know that people like fun. And so entertainment uh, is going, that, that's a big part of what's to come. You know, when you say what what's the overall picture, I think more so during the winter months will be our time to 
kind of hold some uh, benefits and galas and maybe a ball. Something that's really going to innovatively bring people together and we can still use that time to spread the message. Yeah, absolutely. I, what I encourage people to do who have been moved by this story or any of the, the, the tragic passings of anybody of violence, anybody of violence, because uh, this type of pain knows no sexuality limitation. So uh, to support our Save the Life, Stop the Violence campaign, and they can do so by contributing to the Stiletto Sisters GoFundMe page. You know, every dollar helps. Right now, as I said, we're we're building a website where we're going to turn a Philip Randall Park into, I don't know, what's an explosion of yellow? <laughs> you know, we, we wear yellow to represent life uh, in all of the, the show things that we do. So, uh, you know, I don't know. I've already told them I want yellow cupcakes, yellow balloons, you know. I, I want it to really symbolize that. Um, and I will say this and, and encourage people who are hurting to, re, to know that death has not won. I heard that for the first time when Whitney Houston died, Bishop T.D. Jakes delivering her eulogy said that. And in, in that moment, I couldn't understand it. Years later, when I watched it for some, uh, you know, I think just I wanted to watch it. And I heard that. Death has not won. There were so many people in the Bible that fought, and yet they died. They fought the good fight, and yet they died. But what Jesus died for is a reminder that death has not won. So through the tears I may shed, through whatever uh, inadequacies I may feel, I rise every day to do what I do as a remembrance of myself and to all those who are hurting. The death is not one. I'd just like to take this time to thank Chloe very much for sitting with me. She had me in her mother's home and they were so kind and so nice and so open. And I think it's really important when we're covering stories like this as journalists to make sure that we're listening to people in the community that this affects. We make sure that they have a seat at the table and also we work to learn who the people are that we've lost. Because like Chloe said, lost knows no gender identity. This has been Postmortem with Destiny.